today we are going to do transformation it's the first in this series we've left all the early period sonnets the 14 of them and we've come straight to the philosophical ones we can um, show the first uh, reference mona so if you see in the reference i have added the rhymes so this in this it's an 8 and 6 lines and uh, he has used the rhyme a b b a a b b a was the poet uses his own poetic license and the very in whatever manner he wants to frame the rhyme in the second verse it is c d c e d e so the first and the third line match the rhyme and the fourth and the sixth line rhyme and the second and the fifth line rhyme in the last six lines so this is the rhyme that he has used for this particular sonnet let's read the sonnet once my breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream it fills my members with a might divine i have drunk the infinite like a giant's wine time is my drama or my pageant my dream now are my illumined cells joy's flaming scheme and changed my thrill and branching nerves to find channels of rapture opal and higher line for the influx of the unknown and the supreme i am no more a vessel of flesh a slave to nature and her lead and rule i am caught no more in the senses narrow mesh my soul unhorizoned widens to measureless sight my body is god's happy living tool my spirit a vast sun of deathless light so we can um, remove the yeah so this sonnet highlights in a powerful and graphic language the change that comes into a person when he is transformed he has transmuted from an ordinary consciousness to the spiritual consciousness it describes the one who has crossed over from one bank of the river to the other shore someone who is crossed over and not only crossed over to come back again he has got stabilized in that other consciousness he is rooted in that other consciousness there is no more a shift from that consciousness then the changes that happen this sonnet highlights that this sonnet is a classic example of the fourth category of prapti what we had called the actual state of spiritual consciousness we had given four categories this is a perfect example of the fourth category of um sri aurobindo's sonnets where he describes the actual state of the spiritual consciousness once someone has realized the spiritual state of consciousness when one receives after one has practiced complete self denial of the world and he gets blessed with a spiritual consciousness now this has been even more graphically described in a later poem it's called thought the paraclete a little difficult poem and it's not a sonnet so it's not in our vision to be done in the next few months for instance in this <clears throat> sonnet he says my breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream now earlier medical scientists believed that the physical body has no connection with the emotional body the psychological body the mental emotional psychology psychological parts are not connected to the physical parts but later on they discovered and they coined the term psychosomatic and they realized that it's there is a great amount of intermingling 
an interpenetration between the different parts of our being. And one part influences the other. For instance, when a person is suffering from tension and from stress, it can cause him dyspepsia, indigestion, ulcers. Now this is the mind influencing the body. Now the body also can influence the mental thinking. One who is suffering from depression, when he is injected with a mood elevator, he becomes optimistic and cheerful. That means something that has gone to the body has been able to influence the mind. In this sonnet, this interaction, this interpenetration is discussed. But there is a big difference. The difference is that it is the spiritual consciousness that is affecting changes in the body. The, spirit, the being has established himself. He has become stiff in the spiritual consciousness. And once he has become stiff in the spiritual consciousness, then what are the changes that he is experiencing in his own body are graphically described by Sri Aurobindo in this sonnet, Transformation. Let's read the first three lines. <clears throat> My breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream. It fills my members with a might divine. I have drunk the infinite like a giant's wine. See, when one is agitated or anxious, one breathes fast. One's breath becomes jerky. But when one is very peaceful, one's breathing becomes calm, steady and very peaceful. Agitated breathing drains one's energy. While then there, when there is a rhythmic, peaceful, calm breathing, it fills one with energy. This is something that we all have noticed. Now here the poet is saying, my breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream. And why is it running in a subtle rhythmic stream? Because he says, can everybody mute their uh, laptops, please? Because the poet says, I have drunk the infinite like a giant swine. What does he mean by giant swine? It means that he has drunk the infinite goblet after goblet after goblet after goblet. He has drunk the infinite barrels full like a giant would drink wine. How does one drink the infinite? One drinks the infinite when all that one sees, one sees only the infinite. In all, all the sight, one sees only the infinite. All the sounds that come to one, one hears only the infinite. The purr of a cat, the, some, the, the, the sound that comes out of your air conditioner, the sound of a car, the sound of somebody getting angry on you, all the sounds for the person who has become a sthita, sthita pragya, for him all the sounds are the sounds of the divine. For him, all the smells, he smells only the divine. For him, all that he eats, all that he drinks, all that he tastes, for him, he is tasting only the divine. For him, all that he touches and feels, what does he feel? He feels only the divine touch. Everywhere in, through all his senses, he drinks the divine. And that is why he says, I have drunk the divine, I have drunk the infinite like a giant's wine. It fills my members with a might divine. So, <clears throat> this has changed his very breathing pattern. And his breathing pattern is no longer jerky. It has become steady, subdued, subtle, and very rhythmic. 
And this kind of a breathing pattern is filling his whole being with infinite energy, with a might divine, he says, fills my members with might divine. I have drunk the infinite means also that whatever he is experiencing, he is experiencing the divine and he has internalized the divine. He has internalized the infinite and has made the infinite an integral part of his being. His whole being is, has now become the infinite. The infinite has become his being. His being has become the infinite. Let's read these three lines again before we proceed to the fourth. You can meditate on these three lines as we read them. My breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream. It fills my members with a might divine. I have drunk the infinite like a giant's wine. Time is my drama or my pageant dream. Now, when does time become one's drama? When one has moved from this worldly consciousness to the cosmic consciousness. And this is cosmic consciousness. In the ordinary consciousness, how do we experience time? We experience time as the past, the present, and the future. And we live from one moment to the next moment. That's, that's the limit of our vision of time. But in the cosmic consciousness, one can see the whole time span in one glance. There could be another explanation of, in fact, there can be two explanations of time is my drama. Time is my drama would mean that whatever is elapsing in time, I am the dramatist of it. I am writing the drama of time, whatever drama happens in time. I am writing the drama. I am the dramatist. Time is my drama or my pageant stream. And the other meaning could be that I can see from above this whole drama of time, which means I can see the details and the totality both together. Let me give you an example. When we go to a museum and we see an artwork, we have to, if we want to see in detail, we have to look at one art at a time and then look at it in detail and then move to the next artwork. But when, you, when one is able to see the whole drama of time, at this one glance, one is able to see the totality, one is able to see the whole together and also in detail. Such becomes the vision. Now, pageant means a series of shows. So what he means by pageant is that the transformed vision is able to see time all together and as a pageant in successive jhakis, in successive frames, so to say. Right? So let us read these four lines together. My breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream. It fills my members with a might divine. I have drunk the infinite like a giant swine. Time is my drama or my pageant dream. So clear up till now are my illumined cells, joy's flaming scheme. See, now he's describing what happens to his cells, to his senses, to his nerves. Right within his body, what, is, what are the changes that are happening in his cells, in his nerves, and in his senses? Swami Dayanand Saraswati used to do a lot of heart yoga. And by heart yoga, he had purified his body in such a manner 
that he had rid his body of all the physical impurities. There was no physical impurity left in his body and his body had become completely transparent to his vision. For his vision. Please, can I say something? Yeah, sure. He was given uh, poison 16 times in his lifetime and he survived those. Yes. And in the end, when he had to have it the 17th time, that is when he couldn't take it. 16 times he survived the poison given by his enemies to him. Because, because of his Hatha yeah, Yoga. Because of his Hatha Yoga, yeah. he has purified his body to the ultimate level. He could, he could, he had a vision. In his vision, he could see the blood coursing through his arteries and veins. They, they had, Samadhi, he took for so long, so many yeah, because he had complete control over his body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had absolute control of his body and the cells of his transformed body had become completely free of all opacity. They were not opaque anymore. They'd become transparent. They'd become translucent. You know, all opaqueness of his cells had gone. Now, here... Sri Aurobindo is giving a description of his own cells. He says, now are my illumined cells. His cells have become illuminated. They become luminous. The light from within, because the nucleus of every cell is the divine. But because of the impurity around the center, the, around that, there is op opacity, there is opaqueness. Because there is impurity. But now that they've all become pure, they become like glass. And so the light from within each cell is showing outwardly. And that is why he says, now are my illumined cells. Now the cells have become illuminated. But these illuminated cells, what is their scheme? What is their plan? Their scheme is joy's flaming scheme. Joy's flaming scheme means that the theme, the pattern of these illumined cells is to reflect the ananda, reflect the joy that is hidden beneath, inside each cell in the nucleus. And who is that ananda? It is the Supreme Lord himself. The nucleus of every cell is the Supreme Lord himself. And what is the nature of the Lord? The nature of the Lord is Ananda. The nature of the Lord is joy. And now that the cells have been completely purified, the center, which is light, which is illumination, luminosity, is, has decided that the divine's Ananda, the divine's joy, will pour out of each cell of his, of his body. How, I mean, how beautiful can that be? Up till the cells of his body, up till now the cells of his body was subservient to nature. But now he has, that he has drunk the infinite like a giant swine, the cells of his body are not subservient to nature anymore. And they become luminous centers of joy. Now are my illumined cells joy's flaming skin. Mantric words. When we read them, we also see a kind of a path that's chalked out for us. That we too will follow that path, however long it takes to reach. But at least we have a path to follow. Right? Should I go ahead? And changed my thrilled and branching nerves to find channels of rapture opal and highly for what for the influx of the unknown and the supreme i'll read these four lines again now are my illumined selves joy's flaming scheme the plan of these illuminated selves is to reflect is to pour out the joy which is the nucleus of every cell because it is the joy, the ananda 
the presence of the divine in each cell is now going to manifest itself out of each cell. Now are my illumined cells joy's flaming scheme and changed my thrilled and branching nerves to fine channels of rapture, opal and high illumined for the influx of the unknown and the supreme. Now opal is a white stone and it is famous for its multicolored reflection. It reflects many colors. And hyaline is a Greek adjective for being glassy. We just talked about it now. That transparency always comes when there is purity. Whenever there's purity, all that is opaque starts becoming cleaner and cleaner and cleaner till it becomes transparent or translucent. Right? And becomes totally transparent. Now, nerves. Now here he is talking of the nerves. Earlier he was talking of the cells. Now he's talking of the nerves. So nerves are generally channels of electrical impulses. Right? Which become sensations. So through the nerves, electrical impulses pass through and these are read as sensations. And normally, sensations are pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Clear? Sri Aurobindo explains that now in his transformed body, every sensation is only a different kind of a joy. Because the Supreme is flowing through each nerve. He can experience the flow of the divine in each nerve for the influx of the unknown and the Supreme. The Supreme can now enter influx and flow in his body. Why? Because of the total absence of any resistance, any obstruction. Now he feels that his nerves have just become channels of, and what kind of channels? Of opal and hyaline. They are transparent like glass and they are reflecting the multiple colors of the divine. And the divine is in flux. He has entered into these, into these nerves and he can feel the thrill of the joy, the joy, the ananda, the love flowing through his nerves. He feels, he experiences the divine flowing through his nerves. What does it mean? It, it just reminded me of a verse from Isha Upanishad because we've just finished the Isha Upanishad. That now his body does not shrink from anyone. There is no disgust that the body feels anymore. Here we can um, uh, just take out the second reference. This is a reference from Isha Upanishad Mona. Remember the sixth verse? Yastu Sarvani Bhutani Atman Yevan Upashyati Sarva Bhute Shuchatmanam Tatona Vijukupsate. But he who sees everywhere the self in all existences and all existences in the self, my breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream. It fills my members with a light divine. I have drunk the infinite like a giant swine. Time is my drama or my pageant dream. Now are my illumined cells joy's flaming scheme and changed my thrilled and branching nerves to find channels of rapture opal and hyaline for the influx of the unknown and the supreme. All right, we'll move ahead. I am no more a vassal of flesh, a slave to nature and her leaden rule. Vassal means slave. And leaden means something that drags one downwards because of its weight, its leaden weight, right? 
India has been in the vassalage of foreign rulers for centuries. So vassal, vassalage means slavery. Now, what is Sri Aurobindo experiencing? He is experiencing that the demands of the flesh do not bind him anymore. What are the demands of the flesh? Some of the bondages of the flesh are the need for food, the need for sleep, the need for sex, and many other such. In fact, uh, there is, it's a little long passage, but I pulled it out uh, from Life Divine. It may sound difficult, but it is very meditative. It is what Sri Aurobindo has kind of laid out, put forth as an ideal for the human race. What is Sri Aurobindo's ideal for the human race? What is it that we have to walk towards? So it's a passage from Life Divine. It's reference three Mona. We'll read it very slowly. I know it's a very long sentence. To know, possess, and be the divine being in an animal and egoistic consciousness. To convert our toilet or obscure physical mentality into the plenary supramental illumination. So the first is to know, possess, and be. We have to become the divine being. In what? In this animal and egoistic consciousness. This animal and egoistic consciousness must first know. Then it must possess God. And then it must become God. And what does it have to do? It has to convert our toilet or obscure physical mentality into the plenary supramental illumination. Right now we are in the toilet where there is sometimes light and sometimes darkness. Sometimes illumination and sometimes ignorance. But we have to convert it and we have to convert it into what? Into the plenary, complete supramental illumination. Then to build peace and a self-existent bliss there, there is only a stress of transitory satisfactions besieged by physical pain and emotional suffering. Right now, where are we? We are under a stress of transitory satisfactions. Sometimes we are satisfied, but then we get besieged. We get besieged by what? By physical pain, emotional suffering, and that has to change. What do we have to do? We have to build peace and a self-existent bliss. We have to establish an infinite freedom in a world which presents itself as a group, group of mechanical necessities. When we find necessities in ourselves, that I need this, then we are not free. We are bound by our necessities. To discover and realize the immortal life in a body subjected to death and constant mutation. This is offered to us as the manifestation of God in matter and the goal of nature in her terrestrial evolution. So this manifestation of God in matter is what Sri Aurobindo is experiencing and has written down his experience in the sonnet transformation. Yeah, we can remove the reference. So, we are doing this line. I am no more a vassal of flesh, a slave to nature and her leaden, leaden rule. So the poet is no more in the bondages of flesh like food, sleep, sex and others. He is no longer a slave to the demands of nature and a fixed leaden rule. His cells, his nerves, his senses, all, of, all parts of his physical body have transmuted. They have become divine. They are manifesting the divine. Right? I am caught no more in the senses' narrow mesh. 
mesh is that network which binds you inside. So he first talked about his cells, how the cells have become illumined and now they are manifesting the joy from the nucleus of the cell. Then he talked about his nerves, how they become channels for the divine love and ananda to flow through them because the nerves have become opal and high line. They become glassy, they become transparent. And now he talks about his senses. The world can be experienced only through the senses. But the constraint, the limitation of the senses actually ties up our experience because the experience is done by the senses. And if the senses are constrained, like he says, I am caught no more in the senses narrow mesh. Generally, our senses are caught in a narrow mesh. But now, his senses are no longer constrained. And if the senses are opaque or dusty or murky, a person who has a vision, they can make out. The mother used to say when a person would come in a disturbed state of mind, she could see black spots in the aura of that person. She could see it with her physical eyes. Swarvindo said once, I could see his anger mounting up the stairs coming towards me. He could see the anger. He could see anger as anger, which was coming up. This is the murkiness that we were talking about. But here the poet is saying that he is no longer confined. He is no longer confined to the narrow, narrowness of murky, opaque senses. Now he is not, the, his senses are not caught in a network. They have become free of the network and the senses can experience the divine in all. As I said earlier, that he, wherever he looks, he sees the divine. There's a beautiful um, poem, sonnet of his. I think it's a divine sight. There is another sonnet of his, which is the divine hearing. So how every sound that he could hear, he could just experience the sound of the divine. For him, it was no longer the purring of the cat or a machine or a human voice. For him, it was all the divine sound. We should actually do the divine hearing after this. So we move ahead. My soul. Somebody wants to say something? Okay, I'll go ahead. My soul, unhorizoned, widens to measureless sight. My soul, unhorizoned, widens to measureless sight. So the poet's soul has spilled outside his body. It is it's like the banks of a river in spate, in flood. It is, it is no longer, his soul is no longer confined to the narrow frame of the body. It has become much larger than him. When we say, oh, magne mire, so we say that, oh, soul become larger and larger. So here the poet is saying, Sri Aurobindo is saying, my soul is no longer horizon, it has not been meshed in by my body. My soul, unhorizon, widens to measureless sights. It can, it has gone well beyond the parameters of my body. You know, this is somewhat like the cosmic consciousness. When one reaches the cosmic consciousness, one experiences the whole universe as one's own being. That verse that we just read from the Isha Upanishad, Yastu Sarvani Bhutani, Atman Yevanu Pashyati, Tatra Komoha Kashoka, Ekadvamanu Pashyata. Such a person cannot feel any shoka, any moha, because he has become one with the whole universe. 
such is the experience of Sri Aurobindo when he writes, My soul, unhorizoned, widens to measureless sight. We spoke yesterday and day before about the seven ignorances. And we said that the most common and most difficult ignorance to get out of is the constitutional ignorance. And constitutional ignorance is the tendency to identify one's whole self with one's physical existence and to completely bypass the presence of the soul. To say that I am this body, that is constitutional ignorance. And Sri Aurobindo is saying he can experience a widening of his soul. It's brimming over and it's becoming one with the cosmic soul. We'll go ahead. The last two lines. My body is God's happy living tomb. My spirit, a vast sun of deathless light. My body is God's happy living tomb. My spirit, a vast sun of deathless light. Now, after reaching this state, why would someone want to remain on earth? So, here Sri Aurobindo explains that the only purpose for his continued existence on earth is to become a joyous instrument of the divine will, which now he has become. The poet Sri Aurobindo has now become a joyous, a perfect tool, Nimitta Matram. He has become a channel of the divine will. In, I was trying to look for some sonnet which would reflect this becoming the divine's will. I couldn't exactly find that, but there is one reference that I have sent. Nature in me one day like him shall sit. Victorious, calm, immortal, infinite. This is from his sonnet, The Inner Sovereign. Nature in me one day like him shall sit. Victorious, calm, immortal, infinite. Now you see the victorious, calm, immortal, infinite is sitting within nature. And what is Sri Aurobindo saying? That nature, this outer body, this outer vital, this outer mental, all of them, one day, they will also, like him, like he, who is sitting inside, who is victorious, calm, immortal, infinite, like them, nature also will become. And that is the purpose. Yeah, we can stop sharing. My body is God's happy living too. That is exactly what is meant by this. That the body has become a joyous tool, a happy tool, a joyous tool and a living tool who's working and, in joy and is in full joy because the divine will is actually being enacted through nature. The nature has been transformed. Right? My spirit, a vast sun of deathless light. In ordinary life, light is experienced in two dimensions. Physical light like day and night, which there are intermissions between light and darkness. And there is a psychological light. The psychological light we experience moments of mental illumination. And alternatively, alternately, we experience moments of darkness and confusion. The famous poet Iqbal has also written, I had given that as a reference, uh, Mona Ma'am, reference five. The, the, Urdu poetry is also beautiful, but I didn't write that down. Iqbal says, Sometimes my penetrative gaze 
tears the heart of existence. It is so penetrative, my gaze, that it can tear through the heart of existence. At other times, it gets entangled in my own confusions and mental formations. So this is the state of our mental light, which is always, we've done, yeah, you can stop sharing, which is always moving like a pendulum between obscure, ment uh, obscure mentality and plenary supramental illumination. It's always moved between the two. Sri Aurobindo also says in Life Divine, what do we have to do? What we had read just now, the passage, to connect our twilit or obscure physical mentality, to connect our twilit or obscure physical mentality into the plenary supramental illumination. So, we are talking of light. Our mind is a twi twilit zone where there is half light and there is half of obscurity. But what has happened to the poet? What has happened to Sri Aurobindo? The poet's true being is now, is the poem, a vast sun of deathless light. Deathless light means it is not like the physical sun. Even the physical sun gets hemmed in when at night the sun's light gets dim and comes through the moon. But here he's saying the light, my spirit has become what? A vast sun of deathless light. It is a sun, but it has a deathless light, light which cannot end, which is, a, which is perennially illuminated. It is a complete plenary illumination. And that is what my, my own spirit has become. So we'll read these last two lines and then the last six lines together. My body is God's happy living tomb. It has become a joyous instrument of the divine's will. My spirit, a vast sun of deathless light. And my soul, Sri Aurobindo's soul, has become illuminated like that sun which is not hemmed in by night, which is a plenary supramental illumination, which is a continuous illumination, which is non-stop. It is a plenary light. Right? So should we read these six lines and then the whole poem again and you reflect upon the meaning as we go along. I am no more a vassal of flesh, a slave to nature and her leaden rule. I am caught no more in the senses narrow mesh. My soul, unhorizoned, widens to measureless sight. My body is God's happy living to me. My spirit, a vast sun of deathless light. We'll read the full poem again. My breath runs in a subtle rhythmic stream. It fills my members with a might divine. I have drunk the infinite like a giant swine. Time is my drama or my pageant dream. Now are my illumined cells joy's flaming scheme. And changed my thrilled and branching nerves to fine channels of rapture, opal and hyaline for the influx of the unknown and the supreme. I am no more a vassal of flesh, a slave to nature and her leaden rule. I am caught no more in the senses narrow mesh. My soul, unhorizoned, 
widens to measureless sight. My body is God's happy living tool. My spirit, a vast sun of deathless light. Anjali, can you please explain once again? Uh, yeah. This one, time is my drama or my pageant dream. Yes. So generally, when we look at time, how do we see time? For us, time is the past, the present, and the future, right? That's the way we look at time, right? But for the person who has realized the Supreme Consciousness, for him, he can see the whole time at one glance. For him, it's no longer divided into the past and the present and the future with a vision which is only up to now. Can you and I see the future? We can't. Can we see the whole past? We can't. So, this could mean that, that he can now see the entire lapse of time from times immemorial to times ahead till the Jata end. Veda. Huh? The Jata Veda. Jata Veda. Very beautiful. Srikal Darshi. Hmm. Who is living in all the three times and can move easily between the three times very conveniently because they are actually not divided. They are divided for the consciousness which is divided. And this could also mean that I am the dramatist of time. I am writing down the drama that is happening in time. It could mean both the things. And as I gave the example that when we are living in the divided time zone because of our limited consciousness, when we see in a museum, we see a painting and we want to see it in detail, we go closer to it, see it in detail and only then can we move to the second. So we are seeing it in partial parts, the whole museum. But for one who is a Jataveda, who becomes one with the Jataveda, he sees all of it together and he can see each one in detail at the same time. Right? This is the vision of one who is saying that time is my drama. I am writing that drama or my pageant dream. Why the word pageant is used? When we, you all must have seen the, the 26th January parade. So what are that? It's called a pageant. One at a time. Wo hai. And we're looking one after the other. We are looking at them. But for him, time has become his drama or his pageant where he can see them one by one if he wants or he can see them all together or he can write that drama of time. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Pleasure. Any other questions? Whenever they talk about divine will, they use the word that the action comes, it's spontaneous. Right? Yes. Yes. And when we did uh, uh, Isha Upanishad, it also said that the divine will, it's all together. The action, the intent, it all comes together, which is the closest to spontaneous. Whereas mm -hmm. we see life, I think first, then there is a pause, then there is an action. So, this, so is this pageant example also indicating that, look, it's all together. Be it the vision of time, be it their action, which is spontaneous to the to these self-realized ones, everything comes together. You can, you can say it like that because the fact is that the knowledge, the intent and the action are not separated in the divine's will. The divine at the same time knows what is to be done. At the same time, the action happens. There is no gap between the knowledge and the intention and the action. Very rightly said. And when a person becomes a, an instrument of the divine's will, the divine's will just flows through that person. instrument ban jayenge, jab hum unki ban jayenge, to hamari through wo bajayenge. Or jab wo bajayenge, he will use me as his flute and it will just flow out of me the action. Jo action wo chate, 
whatever he action he wants he will use the person who has become that perfect instrument and through that perfect instrument the divine action will just flow through spontaneously the the person will not have to think because that action will just keep flowing and the it's just too spontaneous too beautiful pawn, pawn will become a pawn tool it's such a beautiful pawn but it's not a pawn because a pawn becomes a slave here it is there's a happiness to it okay so there is no slavery although we would love to become his slaves right any other questions can i say something yeah sure okay you know what i understood uh, uh, the transformation is in the first two stanzas he explains how the body has become a flute okay and in the last one he explains that uh, that in the first two it's already it's it's a flute and how it has become the flute is in the last last stanza he is comparing like you know when i'm i'm no more a vessel of flesh like i'm i've got rid of all these things that is how the body has got transformed and has become the basuri very nice that i am no longer a slave to the flesh is exactly. no longer a slave to nature's leaden yeah. rule the yes. rule that ties me down that is i'm no longer a slave to that yes i yeah i've just become a pure instrument the yes. senses whose nerves whose cells are yeah. all flowing with the divine ananda the divine yes. love is flowing through my yeah. and and we, we have seen it in swami dayanand saraswati we have seen that it is a possibility and so that is what shukulindo has gone through can you imagine somebody's body that after his death for so many days and there was in pondicherry in that heat in a small room where he was this body was kept without any ice and there were lakhs of visitors for four days they were doing a uh, circumambulation of his body doing pranam to his body and they were saying there are excerpts written by people who had gone there they could smell as if it was a heavenly smell that was coming oh. out of his body and his body was not turning blue this it was not emitting anything that was nasty to the to the to the senses it was turning more and more golden every day it was there was like a golden light coming out of his body and mm. there are so many excerpts written mm. by travelers by bhaktas who were there in those days four days he was kept in a small room yeah it's a phenomena i mean it's so, here it's about the transformation in his body yes yeah thank you so much pleasure it was my pleasure i i got to really read and understand and it's a beautiful journey thanks to you people <laughs> any other any other questions yeah anjali yeah this my members means my body parts yeah members means parts of the body and uh, why does he use unknown to him he is no longer unknown no? where is the word unknown last the sentence of the first part for the influx of the unknown and the supreme so the ah. unknown is no longer unknown to him when he has but to the world he is unknown no for the world he is unknown everybody for us where do we know him what do we know him we but he is from experience yeah but for the unknown money he is mostly unknown by everybody right so for the influx for the entry of the unknown and the supreme yeah yeah thanks yeah the really beautiful bahut it was very beautiful even i thoroughly <laughs> session with you and you bring us one new okay yeah <laughs> i have yahan pahunchna hai so a long journey long long journey everything else every other work except a little of the school work my life everything is on hold you know because after reading all this you don't feel like doing anything else it's like that so ho jayega this is life beautiful <laughs> yeah. very very nice pure anjali so, when are we up for seven ignorances i have not yet taken it out and studied it so i don't know whether we should um, do that in between 
or should we do divine hearing and divine sight or should we do the next uh, sonnet it is a difficult sonnet now we are not going to do nirvana we'll do the other earths the other earths so i have still not decided whether we'll do the other earths or we'll do divine hearing or we'll do the <laughs> seven ignorances let me let me try and find my notes on just one question here yes you know, if you look at it this is giving a illustration of somebody who's achieved vidya you know when we did isha it talked about the contrast of avidya and vidya so this is a self realized soul who's expressing the journey because he's now established being one with the lord right so what what it really makes us think that if we are all aspiring could take multiple lifetimes or if we are aspiring to this goal there seems to be like a perfect version of us that is work in progress right we are all trying to aspire for this and if we achieve this then that's the perfect version because then you become one then you're one with the universe one with the lord so while it is work in progress is there ever a possibility of free will or is it all being orchestrated because when he desires he gives you the option to be part of a quest group to get to know this all of this seems to be happening because one is our our uh, our keenness or our uh, a desire for wanting to understand this to try and be a better version aspiration is there but on the other hand you've gone but on the other hand and then you've gone i can't hear you anymore yogesh okay so i all i was saying is that this to be established and being one with the lord one with the universe is what we heard in this sonnet today and if that being the goal for all of us on this call but it's work in progress right yes i mean this yes. could take multiple lifetimes but of course the only thing that bonds us with this is a earnest desire in our heart saying we want this and as you rightly said one is how how earnest are you is it just a yeah it's good it's a nice half an hour one hour two hour once a week whenever a quest group call happens or is it like no this is my goal this is what i want right but i'm saying while that thought penetration the only thing we can bring on to the table is the sincerity of this earnest goal right yeah yeah and that also is being is grace which is in the loop here so where is there any uh, there seems to be no uh, it's like all orchestrated where is that where is free will in this is my question it was your free will to join quest or not it is your free will to come for this session or not it is your free will to uh after the session is over to go through the poem again and sit for 5 minutes in quietude and absorb the poem it there is no there is nothing that is binding on us we all have that free will and uh, whether we exercise it or we don't is again our free will right right so it's the free will to the goal and how yes. earnest are we it, it to me it boils down to it's the free will of your earnest sincere desire for a goal don't that call it desire drive. call it aspiration okay you goal. can have aspiration. a desire for an ice cream or for a car but when you your desire is for the divine or to become a divine instrument then we can call it an aspiration right 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 so it's it's this absolute sincere because he's residing within all of us so he knows how true how sincere how genuine is that aspiration but yes. it boils down to that one quality which will take us on this goal absolutely sincerity is by far the most important quality most important sincerity aspiration right perfect perfect actually can i add one thing more here <laughs> please please uh, what you were mentioning once that when uh, whatever you are wanting that path becomes wider and wider yes very because, very true yeah because what yogesh is saying ki would i call this free will but somewhere he is aspiring for <coughs> so that's how the universe is bringing it no 
right very beautifully remembered uh, sarita yogesh this is for you to remember that uh, she at least kirit uncle has told me always that law of karma is the law that says that whatever karma i am doing the road for that widens the opportunities for that karma widen the opportunities keep increasing if i am a thief i will get more and more and more opportunity to be able to rob if i am going on the path of uh, reading and meditating and trying to become closer and closer to the divine you will find spontaneously there will be more and more opportunities that will come your way to be able to move on the path that the opportunities will widen the road will widen that is the law of karma according to uh, kiri tankal he said the law of karma is a law of increase whatever you do it will keep increasing right so if Absolutely. you are complaining if you are complaining oh god corona oh my god i am stuck in the home so we are just increasing the the first of all the complaint in my heart and also the the being tied down inside we are increasing that there are people who talk of their ill health all the time and they increase the ill health because that's what the universe is hearing so law of karma being the law of increase let us do everything that we want should increase in our life talk of well being talk of happiness talk of good and the good will just pour itself right yeah so you know the one thing that isha brought to the table for uh, you know bringing awareness was that the best and the most magical bond to have is with him within us the more you engage and back to this earnest uh, you know the more karma you put in this means the more we bond with him within us the more it stays with us he's within me why should i even look at anybody outside yeah sure whatever has to happen but he's residing within the more focus is he is within the communication within the thought within the the fire within the greater would that engage to build it to what you are saying right now i think this seems to be the combination there absolutely very Super. very well remembered sarita thank you thanks so should we end or are there any questions okay. ma'am there was one reference six which we have not Uh, oh yeah to... yeah that's so beautiful i'm so sorry i forgot so we can take that out please okay. let's read these these are just small references from savitri and one of dilip roy he wrote on sri aurobindo still regions of imperishable light calm continents of inviolate peace i mean just look at the imagery still regions of imperishable light calm continents of inviolate peace this is from savitri sun belts of knowledge moon belts of delight dilip roy on sri aurobindo thou has reached what never is at fault the sun of suns no clouds can come to away so just came across these so thought we'd share these as well we can stop sharing theek hai we can do a minute of silence and gratitude to the divine unless someone has something else thank you anjali the way you, you so much sonnets uh, you know the way you once we understand the these sonnets the way we look at it now you know the whole thing changes changes yes very part? beautiful very very beautiful, so beautiful it is really understanding the sonnet was like we are drinking boon by boon the amrit you know Or I can describe it as, as you know, we drinking boon boon करके अमृत पी रहे हैं ऐसी feeling थी यार 
this was very beautiful she had been those poetry is of the next level yeah and you know the i i understand why they call it mantrik poetry because now when we read it and once we've understood then it all becomes so real you know that it's like something that we can walk on we can try to tread that at least aspire to tread on that path so sure. right right love you thank you thank, thank you, you.